Today I'm going to take you through how to perform six different water quality measurements uh, which will indicate to us various physical and chemical parameters of the water we're sampling. Um, so first off I'm going to show you how to use this digital probe uh, so we can find out what the electrical conductivity uh, as well as the temperature is in our sample. Uh, next off we'll use these simple uh, test strips just to find out what the phosphate concentration is as well as the pH of the water. Uh, then we'll be using these turbidity tubes are just to find out basically what the clarity of the water actually is and how much sediment load uh, is captured in the water sample. And then lastly we'll just be showing you how to use these dissolved oxygen titration kits, leaving the trickiest ones for last. The easiest way to actually do this is if we get one big sample and then once we get back to somewhere where we can actually lay out and organise our gear then we can take small samples from this to run all the individual tests. We want to take our sample uh, somewhere just a little bit away from the actual shoreline or somewhere where you can access some good flow. Uh, and when you're walking out to this position, just make sure you're walking upstream so if you disturb any sediment, it doesn't actually contaminate your sample. Once you're in position, what we want to do is just take our sterile water container. Uh, we want to face it upstream, go down and we just want to rinse it three times. So just make sure you're rinsing the lid as well as the actual sample jar as well give it a shake and then just dispose of it behind you downstream again so we don't contaminate our next sample. So we want to repeat this process three times. Alright, when we're actually taking our final sample, what we want to do is just place the container upside down, push down to an area of about 20 centimetres deep and then you want to turn your sample jar sideways, bring it up and then screw on the cap. If the water's too shallow and 20 centimetres deep is going to disturb the sediment, just make sure you take it to a depth of about one third of the total water. We're also going to need to get another sample just in this small glass jar here that's part of the dissolved oxygen kit. Because um, for this test we don't want to get any air at all in the sample jar because that will skew our results. So same process as before, we just want to face upstream, uh, rinse that one three times, again discarding of the water downstream. And once you've done that, we can then take our final sample. So for this you want to invert the jar, take it down to about 20 centimetres, turn the jar sideways, let all that air escape. Just make sure you actually tap the sides to make sure there's no air bubbles left at all. And then you want to take the cap of the sample jar and just screw that on underwater. So once you've done that, bring it up to the top, check you've got no air bubbles, and then you're good to go. So with this one, we still want to leave it sitting around for too long. Um, before we actually do the sample as well. We've gotten ourselves set up here straight after collecting our water sample just so it's sitting around for as little time as possible. Uh, and now we're going to start testing, first looking at electrical conductivity and temperature uh, using our digital probe here. Uh, so when we're measuring electrical conductivity, what we're looking at is how easily electrical current can flow through our water sample. Uh, and this is basically determined by the level of salt dissolved in the water sample. So the higher the concentration of salt, the greater that conductivity is going to be. In our freshwater system, salt content does vary naturally, uh, but it can also be increased from many different types of human land use activities. Uh, and increases in a waterway's salt content outside of its normal range can actually cause stress and harm to our aquatic uh, plants and animals. Uh, and this is just because many of these species can only actually tolerate quite a narrow range in order to actually perform optimally. And then we have temperature which has a huge impact on our fish and other aquatic organisms, often influencing feeding, movement behaviour, triggering breeding seasons and it actually changes some of the chemical variables of the water itself as well. Obviously water temperature is mainly driven by things like weather and climate or the depth and flow of the water um, but also things like if you have clearing of the riparian vegetation that causes shading on the water surface or if you have runoff from cleared or urban areas with warm surfaces this can cause the water temperature to increase. So to do the test first thing we need to do is just grab our plastic beaker, fill this one up with the sample water uh, we just want to rinse it a couple of times just to get rid of any contaminates and to equalise the temperature of it. Uh, so once we've done that about three times, we can take the digital probe, pop that one on, take the cap off and just insert it so it's about three centimetres deep into the beaker. Now what we need to do is look at the display and wait for the tick to appear. That tells us the readings stabilise and then we can take our measurements. 
Now we're going to be measuring phosphorus. So phosphorus is a nutrient, uh, so it's essential for plant and animal growth. Uh, but if we have too much of this, it can cause excessive weed and algal growth in our waterways, clogging and smothering them and reducing flow and habitat. Uh, but this isn't the only issue they cause because sometimes this growth is unsustainable. Uh, and when it decomposes, what it's going to do is suck out all the oxygen out of the water. Increased nutrients in our waterways can be caused from things like runoff from farms and urban areas that contain fertilisers, uh, excessive sediment uh, and animal wastes, and also just from things like bushfires where we have increased organic matter that actually enter our waterways. Uh, and even the actual fire retardant foams they use themselves contain some fertilisers. Phosphorus is usually found in the form of phosphate, and we're going to test for the reactive or soluble phosphate concentration in our water sample. So as before, first thing we want to do is just take our plastic beaker, rinse it out and fill it up. Once we've done that, just grab the plastic test tube supplied with the kit and then we just want to fill it up to the 10 mil mark. Just making sure that the bottom of the meniscus sits on that 10 mil marker there. All right, so now that we've done that, we can grab one of the test strips out of the container when you're doing so, just make sure that you don't touch the pads themselves and put the cap on immediately again. So now I just want to fold it so that the pads are facing inwards. Grab the test tube cap, insert that like so. And now you want to put this whole thing back into the test tube. Now you want to invert this slowly five times. Just making sure the bubble raises to the top. Now we can remove the cap and test strip, just put those aside, grab the container. Now you want to match this up so it sits on the white square. Look down vertically through the test tube and compare the colour of your water sample compared to the colour chart on the container. Match those up, get the closest one you think you can, and then we want to record that information down on the data sheet. Now we're going to be looking at pH just to see how acidic or alkaline our water sample is. Um, so this does vary naturally due to things like the bedrock in the area. Limestone can cause it to be more alkaline, whereas you have basalt and sandstone uh, causing it to be more acidic. Um, but it also fluctuates uh, just due to processes like photosynthesis occurring in the water. Uh, and like the rest of them, these can all be put out of whack by human activity. Changes in pH outside their normal range in a waterway can actually alter the availability of nutrients or increase the uh, solubility of some pollutants already in the waterway. And if it's severe enough, it can actually cause harm to the skin and gills of fish uh, and other aquatic organisms. So as the previous test, we just want to rinse and refill our beaker. Then all we have to do is take one of the test strips out, out of the packet, make sure to not touch the coloured strips on the end. Insert that one in, hold for a little bit, make sure there's no bubbles, take it out and just get rid of any excess water. Then all we've got to do is just match all the colours on the test strip with those shown on the colour chart and find the closest one. Uh, see which category that falls into and then record that one down. Next up we're going to be testing the clarity of our water uh, and this is measured in nephilometric turbidity units or NTUs. Uh, to do this we're going to be using this turbidity tube here. This test is going to tell us about the load of suspended particles in the water, uh, which could be made up of silt, mud or clay, uh, or fine organic material or even algae. Uh, so high turbidity, uh, if severe enough, can shade out the sun and if this persists for a long enough time, it can cause a lot of stress to our aquatic plants, uh, or if it's high enough, even clog the gills of our fish in the waterway. To perform the test for turbidity, we just want to do it somewhere out of direct sunlight. Uh, we just want to stir the sample up first just to resuspend any sediment and then what we're going to do is just very gradually pour our sample liquid into the turbidity tube while looking directly down. And we're just going to do little bit by little bit and just continue pouring until the black cross at the bottom of the turbidity tube is barely distinguishable. And at the point you just lose it, we want to stop pouring. And while you're pouring, just make sure you give it time between pours for the water to actually settle uh, so you can see more clearly down the tube. So once you've just lost that cross, you can stop. And what we want to do is just look at the NTU scale on the side of the tube. So we have 15 right here and we just want to record the reading, the next one down from where the water line is. 
Now finally, we're going to be showing you how to do a titration to determine the dissolved oxygen in your waterway. So naturally, dissolved oxygen is vital to our aquatic life and is actually one of the best indicators of overall waterway health uh, and is also often the thing to blame uh, if it's low enough for our fish kills. Dissolved oxygen is introduced into the water by aquatic plants and through the disturbance of the surface of the water. Uh, and things that cause these levels to drop is when the temperature can rise of the water or if there's higher salt concentration or even as organic matter is decomposing. That's why things like bushfires that create so much more of this organic matter and push them into the waterway uh, can cause the oxygen levels to decrease and our fish to potentially suffocate. So this test is a little bit more complicated than the others and we do need to use some harmful chemicals. Um, so just make sure you put on your gloves and safety goggles and read through the instructions before you actually get started. Once you've got your kit on, you just want to grab the sample that we took earlier down at the creek, open that one up, and we're going to get our first reagent, the manganese sulfate solution, and put in eight drops of this. Just to be safe, do it over a waste bucket. And when you're doing so, just make sure the dropper is 100% vertical so you get even drops. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. All right. Pop the cap back on that one, and then immediately get out the alkaline potassium iodide azide, and we're gonna put in eight drops of that one as well. Just repeating the process, keeping it vertical. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If there's any drips, just wipe it off with a paper towel, and then you just wanna put the cap back on. And now we're gonna invert this one slowly three times. Now that we can see that a precipitate has formed and that's just all the oxygen in the water actually reacting with the chemicals that we just inserted. Uh, so now we just need to wait for this to settle um, just till it's about below the shoulder of the sample jar. Uh, this might take a few minutes. Once this sample settled, we can get out our next reagent. This one's going to be the sulfuric acid, so just be careful because this is the nasty one. Take the caps off them both and as before, we're just going to add another eight drops, making sure you do it over the waste container and keeping it. 100% vertical. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now we want to put the cap back on and keep inverting this until all the precipitate is dissolved and it's a pale or dark yellow. Now all the precipitate is completely dissolved, so next step we just want to actually start the titration. So uncap, also take the test tube here, take the cap off that and we're just going to fill it up to the 20 mil mark, doing so over the bucket again. Make sure you're right on the line and just recap your sample, recap the test tube. Now just grab the syringe, take out the sodium thiosulfate and we're just going to extract a full plunger's worth of this. So insert it, invert it and then pull the plunger down until it sits on the zero. At this point, just invert it again, put the cap on. Now we want to slowly dispense the contents of the syringe into our test tube. And while we're doing so, just swirl it continually. And what we're doing is we're going to keep doing this until it's a pale yellow. Now once our sample is a nice pale yellow, we can just extract the syringe, put it in its container, just making sure not to touch the plunger uncap our test tube and now we're going to insert some of the starch solution. Now this indicator solution is going to turn it a nice blue and we just want to put in eight drops again. At this point we just want to recap the test tube and put the syringe back in and now we're going to really slowly drop by drop just add that in while continually stirring the test tube. And we're going to continue doing this process until the solution is completely clear. Our solution has gone completely clear, so we've finished the titration. And what we want to do is just look at where the plunger sits on the syringe. And this is going to correlate to a direct reading in parts per million of dissolved oxygen in your original sample. So just record that down in your worksheet and we're done for this step. Now just empty all your liquids into the waste bucket and then we're just going to dispose of that one appropriately.